Hi, and welcome to HAI and uh, HAI at Work webinar. Today we have a, a, a topic that's a little bit uh, split. Um, our originally scheduled topic was what you don't know about aviation fuel can kill you. Um, on the positive side, we also have a, uh, some really exciting new information about unleaded fuel alternatives that has just been STC'd. And we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. Today we have Jim Viola, who is the president and CEO of Helicopter Association International. We have Zach Noble, director of flight operations and maintenance for HAI. He's gonna be our moderator today. Joining us from uh, the General Aviation Modifications uh, Company Incorporated is George Braley. George is the co-founder of the company and head of engineering at uh, GAMI. And they have just been awarded an STC by the FAA for 100 octane unleaded AVGAS. Also today is Mike Mattern. Mike is the quality assurance manager at Titan Aviation Fuels. He's a 31 year veteran of the US Marine Corps and has served in his current position for 23 years and has seen just about every mistake that can be made in fuel handling. Uh, Mike travels the country putting on fuel safety seminars for Titan clients and others. Our webinars, as always, are interactive. We do encourage you to ask questions. Questions will be answered, um, addressed at the end of the webinar. Uh, we will not be taking questions during the webinar. To submit your question, please use the question module that's part of the uh, uh, Zoom system. Usually that's down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it could be on the side depending on how you have your system set up. The chat function is fine. Please go ahead and use that if you wanna talk with other attendees. Um, but for the questions, we're only gonna really be focusing on that question module. And so we do ask that you put uh, the questions there. Today's webinar is being recorded. We will try to get this uh, webinar posted as quickly as possible to our website and our YouTube channel. That usually happens within 24 hours, but sometimes can take as long as Monday. I'd now like to introduce uh, Jim Viola, President and CEO of HAI. All right, getting all the technical stuff together. Now, great, it's uh, great to be on with uh, these two experts and, and Zach, I appreciate you uh, putting this together. Yeah, see you yet. Well, how about that? There we go, nice. All right, thanks, I was close. So like I said, I'm excited to be here with uh, these two fuel experts and then uh, and Zach putting it together and Dan is always, you know, getting our at work webinars going. So earlier this year, the FAA launched what was called the Eagle program. And the reason that we did that uh, in conjunction with industry was the to eliminate aviation gasoline lead emissions. You know, the goal of the program is to safely eliminate the use of lead aviation fuel by the year 2030. And the reason we came up with a mark on the wall is because we know there's a lot of work to be done to actually get there. And number two, we wanted to let people know that we were actually concerned as well that uh, you know it, it's time to get the lead out of uh, all fuel. Now, HI has been a supporter of the Eagle Project all along with the other general aviation associations and the petroleum companies that produce the different types of aviation fuels. Uh, you know, Mark Baker is kind of lead because, you know, there's a lot of aircraft out there, a lot of different engines out there. And, uh, and he certainly was one of the guys that kicked off a panel that we had at EAA's Air Venture in Oshkosh in July, where I joined the leaders of these groups to reinforce our commitment to finding solutions. And it wasn't that we were trying to, you know, really, we're looking for multiple winners if there's winners. Is there a winner? I mean, the winner is the environment. The winner is the people um, that you know, to get the, the better fuel, we are looking at sustainability across the board. And so trying to get uh, the lead out for a cleaner environment was something that we are all committed to. And certainly on this uh, webinar today, you'll, you'll see that and feel that. You know, the elimination of lead aviation fuel is, is not a new issue, but it's certainly become a priority, you know, and California is banning the sale of lead fuels on, on an airport there. And that causes some, some safety concerns of you know, we just got to the point where we're not having people run out of fuel, but if you land at an airport and all of a sudden you realize that you don't have the fuel and now you got to try to figure out to get fuel to get to the next place that does have gas, you know, that becomes a safety issue. So from that, we want to make sure that, you know, availability is there and we want California to, to stop closing airports because there is an answer. But at the same time, we want to let them know that that answer isn't tomorrow. 
And hopefully George can help, uh, you know, maybe highlight how long it's going to be before we can actually start, you know, probably maybe we're going to highlight uh, California's place to go first. So from the outside, it seems simple to say, okay, let's stop using AV, stop using lead fuels, because we did that in the vehicles, and it took a little while to get to the aircraft. And the reason, because you might hear some of the numbers today, but it's a small percentage on the aviation side. And then, you know, as we go through this, Zach, you know, if you can focus in on uh, our audience, which is piston-powered helicopters, you know, so it's even a smaller segment of all the piston engines that are out there. So I think the, the audience knows that the people who work in the aviation have never been against unleaded fuel. We're just, you know, lit human, and we're trying to work through all the different ways of making that. The difference is aviation certification standards. By automobiles and fuel that they use must meet standards set by the government. You know, when something goes wrong on the ground, the vehicle may come to a halt. When something happens in the air, we all know that uh, safety is impacted. And those standards are really higher for aviation because we need that that level of safety. So I, I fly a piston powered helicopter regularly and it uses avgas. And so this issue there certainly has my attention. Uh, you know, I wish I could do an easy mod over and, and fly a turbine, but uh, you know, I've got to figure out my economics as well. And, uh, and so piston certainly serves me well. And I'm glad that uh, we've got the, you know, the unleaded future coming our way. And, and I'm hopefully, you know, Certainly, congratulations to Gammy and George on this significant achievement, and uh, and I can't wait to begin using their new fuel in, in the helicopter that I fly. It might take a while for this fuel to be ready, and that's kind of what I'd like to get out of today is you know how long and what that path ahead is, and and uh, but we're excited. We really are excited to finally be part of the unleaded community as we move forward. And so uh, this webinar was planned a time ago, and and we're looking now that, that we were able to get. Uh, Gamma co-founder George Barely and willing to join us for this, and we got Mike Matter from uh, Titan Fuels. So I know George has a busy schedule with all that's going on, and so Zach, I'm going to throw it over to you and lead the discussion. Let's kick us off. Hey Jim, thanks. Um, appreciate it. Um, this is a great opportunity to uh, to talk about fuels. Um, happy to have uh, Mike Mattern from Titan Aviation here to discuss uh, everything from from how it's made to how it's delivered and how to take care of it once once it shows up at the local airport and then what you do with it afterwards. Um, timing is everything in aviation, and, and uh, because GAMI was issued the the STC last week, uh, and we were putting together this webinar for this week, it was you know, perfect timing. To, to ask George Braley to come on from GAMI and, and talk to us about the SDC. Uh, George has, has got a short timeline with us today because he has follow-on meetings uh, immediately afterwards. So without um, reservation, I'd like to, uh, in addition to many other people, say thanks to uh, George and, and uh, GAMI for reaching a chemical solution to the unleaded fuel challenge. Um, so uh, I'm excited excited about it. I fly piston-powered airplanes. And then on the other side of the coin, I fly turbine-powered helicopters uh, lately. So um, this fuel issue and uh, the, the fuel challenges that we have before us are, are important to all of our members and uh, important to, to us at HAI. So George, without uh, slowing you down, bud, talk to us about your SDC and, and what we can expect moving forward. Sure. I appreciate the invitation. And I'm sorry I'm on a, a short fuse, but uh, uh, Seems like uh, since uh, last Thursday, uh, when the announcement came from the FAA, uh, our telephone has not stopped ringing. <laughs> um, and I've got another Zoom call here in a few minutes. So uh, basically, the uh, there's an uh, an aircraft and an engine pair of STCs with corresponding approved model lists. The engine STC, the approved model list, includes, I believe, every piston, spark ignition, piston power, piston engine in the FAA's database. I think, haven't double verified it, but somebody checked for me earlier today. I think it actually already includes the, uh, uh, the, uh, the spark ignition piston engines that are used in helicopters. The 
aircraft uh, AML includes all the corresponding aircraft, but it does not yet include rotorcraft. Uh, that's uh, one of the items on our to-do list to go do is to get the rotorcraft uh, added on the AML. Uh, and hope that should be fairly straightforward because uh, all of the data is is uh, uh, is already there. Uh, there's not frankly any new tests or anything else that need to be done. The, the similarity argument should win the day for that. Um, the The real challenge is to uh, change all of the infrastructure that's focused around producing. Uh, ASTM D910 low lead uh, to uh, producing the G100 UL high octane AVE gas. Um, you know, this is a huge infrastructure change. It's a, you know, it's uh, it's like the you know the San Andreas fault moving in, in terms of the fuel world. Uh, we have been in serious negotiations with one of the very largest oil companies. Uh, uh, about uh, undertaking this, and we're open to uh, other inquiries. Uh, we actually had calls from two other refineries uh, within 36 hours after the announcement came from the FAA last uh, Thursday. Um, the fuel is not hard to make. Uh, it, it's basically made from traditional components that are made in, in uh, in, in large refineries uh, already today with one exception. Uh, that exception is a very small fraction of the total fuel and it is also available uh, uh, separately. So the, there's, and there, look, there's nothing hard or magic about making the fuel. I can blend 10,000 gallons, you know, on the ramp outside my office, 50 yards away from where I'm sitting. Uh, and, uh, and and you know it doesn't it doesn't take an enormous amount of skill or or technology to do that. Um, the the fuel is completely interchangeable with hundred low lead. Um, it uh, you can mix it in the fuel tank on the airplane in any fraction or any proportion. You can mix it in the fuel tank the, uh, that belongs you know, to the FBO that's under the control of the FBO uh, at the airport in any fraction. Uh, let me give you one example of that. And, and look, there are web, you know, there's, there's interviews out there. I mean, uh, Aviation Consumers done a couple. Uh, uh, AOPA has done a couple. And a lot of this is out there already on YouTube stuff. But one one kind of fairly significant and useful uh, example. Let's say that an airport has got one hundred low lead tank and one jet fuel tank, and they want to switch over from from hundred low lead to the uh, unleaded high octane G one hundred UL. They can take their ten thousand gallon tank at the airport and burn it down so that it's got thousand or fifteen hundred gallons left in it. Pick up the phone. When it's available, order a truckload, an 8,000 gallon truckload of, of G100 UL uh, AVE gas. It can show up at the airport two or three days later. You can dump that fuel in on top of whatever remains of the 100 low lead. And there's a provision in the G100 UL specification that defines the residual fuel from intermixing the two to be a fuel that still conforms to the G100 UL specification. That's really important because otherwise you'd have to clean the tanks. Uh, and then when you clean the tanks, you'd be dealing with hazmat and, and all kinds of those kinds of problems. So by having uh, thought about this problem and the supply chain problem and the distribution and the transition problem, when we were drafting that specification 10 years ago, uh, that provision turns out to be more and more uh, uh, important. Um, as originally envisioned in the original uh, specification approved by the FAA, the field was not dyed. It had a kind of a, uh, a yellow orange color to it. Um, it was fairly pronounced in that respect. Um, there are some versions of that that have 
a less pronounced uh, 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 coloration. If you can pull up the slide that uh, I sent to you. Yeah, thank you. So over on the left, you see a, a graduated cylinder that has uh, a G100UL uh, sample in it without any dye of any kind. That is native as the fuel would be originally produced. Um, if you mix that thing on the left with 100 low lead 50-50, then you get something that looks like that blue stuff in the smaller graduated cylinder. Uh, and you get exactly uh, something very similar, but uh, a little more pronounced. If instead of mixing it directly with 100 low lead, if you were to add the same dye that goes into 100 low lead and do so in approximately the same concentration that it goes into 100 low lead, if you went to a fourth grade art class, they taught you about mixing yellow and blue, and what you typically get is green, and that's what you see in the jar on the right. We have uh, a pending amendment to the specification to allow or to not to allow, but to require the use of the dye. That suggestion was made to us by the Quality Assurance Department at Exxon because they were concerned that at least some versions of jet fuel can have a straw color. Uh, and they wanted to avoid any possibility of uh, misfueling accidents due to that potential confusion. Uh, we thought it was an excellent idea, as did the FAA. And uh, that uh, minor amendment uh, to the specification uh, should be in place within the next uh, week or 10 days. Um, the, uh, you know, an airplane can land with half tanks, put this fuel in on top of it, and when it flies away, they're flying away with a fuel that conforms to the specification. That eliminates all kinds of, of uh, insurance questions and, uh, you know, other kinds of questions about what's legal and what's safe. Uh, all of that was vetted. Um, anybody really uh, has some questions they'd like to ask, I'd be glad to, 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 to answer some questions. Like I say, most of this stuff has been vetted uh, on one of the multiple YouTube uh, uh, interviews that have been done over the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Hey, George. Thanks. Um, thanks for the opportunity. We've got a couple of questions that, that are, are coming in. And uh, were the uh, helicopter OEMs, were they given the opportunity to test the fuel um, before it was approved on the AML? Well, the, the engines uh, are on the engine AML. The rotorcraft are not on the uh, are not on that, and so there's a, a process ongoing right now to open an additional STC to include the, if you will, the rotorcraft airframes. Okay, and since then, do you know if, if any helicopter OEM OEMs have reached out to to we, get a sample from you guys? We, we we have been talking to Robinson about trying to do that. It is my intention that when we get uh, the first batch of fuel. Uh, headed to California that they're going to get some fuel uh, and they've got a plan for for doing some testing there at uh, uh, at their uh, uh, production facility in, in Los Angeles County. Another question uh, that came in is how does the 100 uh, UL fuel, how does it change my engine proficiency? Does it, so will I see a difference on my uh, like my JPI indicator, will it will it give me a different uh, exhaust gas temperature or CHT temperatures? How uh, how about uh, you know economy? Does it get is it different than than traditional low lead? Um, it's actually a very good question. Uh, I haven't exactly seen that exact question asked, but uh, let me give you an example. Early on. I'm talking 12 years ago now, when we were first flying the fuel, we were flying it in a turbo normalized Cirrus. And Alan Klatmeyer from Cirrus heard about it. He flew down to Ada and wanted to go fly. So we took the airplane up to, I don't know, 10 or 12,000 feet. 
he had he already in his mind had a plan that he wanted to execute. We set the airplane up, put it on the autopilot, got it running uh, at the POH, uh, in that case with a lean mixture setting at about 17.0 gallons an hour. And the plane was all settled in. And we had uh, 100 low lead in the left tank and G100 UL in the uh, Ave gas in the right tank. And he just simply switched the fuel valve from the left tank to the right tank and then sat there with his arms crossed. Uh, well, just due to the difference in plumbing, the fuel flow changed about a tenth. Uh, so we reset that so that it was still flowing at 17.0 gallons again. Again, this is running with a, a mixture 60, 70 degrees lean of peak uh, in the aircraft. And of course, it has that big, beautiful, state of the art digital engine monitor with all the EGT, CHDs, all that stuff. And we sit there and watch for a while. And I, I, I asked Alan, I said, Alan, I said, what are you looking at so hard? And he said, I'm just watching the airspeed indicator. And I said, well, hell, you're not going to see a difference. And he said, well, I already can. It's one knot faster. He said, why is it one knot faster? Well, I kind of chuckled because I knew the answer. And I said, well, I said, tell you what, why don't you switch back to 100 low lead and let's see what happens. So he switches it back to 100 low lead. And we sit there and about three minutes later, he says, well, we're one knot slower. He said, but the fuel flow is the same. I said, yes. Try it one more time. So he went back and forth about three times, verified it. It ranged anywhere from one to one and a half, maybe one and three quarter knots difference. Well, the reason is pretty simple. The fuel flow is metered volumetrically by the gallon. That's what's reported on the screen. And on a volumetric basis, the G100UL has a slightly higher energy density. It's on the order of 1%, 1.5%. Well, if you've got a lean mixture and the energy density on gallon per hour basis is uh, a little higher, the engine will make that much more horsepower, 1.5% more horsepower. And that was the difference in the airspeed. Um, so then I had him redo that. And when he went to the G100UL, I said, all right, pull the fuel flow from 17 back to about 16.8 and sit there and watch it for a while while it's settled in at the same airspeed. Now, those are differences that you can only see or appreciate on an exquisitely instrumented aircraft under perfectly stable conditions in flight. Uh, nobody else is ever gonna appreciate that there's any difference at all. Yeah, so, so that, you just said something that triggered something for me. Does it weigh the same per gallon? No, it weighs. It typically, it typically weighs around 6.3. It can be as light as 6.15 and as heavy as about 6.4. But what people don't understand is that traditional Abe gas can weigh as little as 5.82 and as much as 6.3 itself, uh, depending on okay. who makes it, where they make it. Uh, there's, you know, you can't get wrapped around the axle over the that minor difference in the weight. Okay. But it just generally weighs just a little bit more. Um, will my engine last longer with unleaded fuel? Uh, nobody knows for sure, but the available evidence says almost certainly. Uh, you know, I'm old enough to remember changing spark plugs every 10,000 miles uh, in my first two or three automobiles uh, that burned leaded fuel. Uh, and overhauling the engines at 60, 70, 80, 90,000 miles. And when we got rid of the leaded fuel, you know, the, the last time I changed a set of spark plugs, it was at 80,000 miles. And the, you know, the engines at 200,000 and, and still going strong. Uh, maybe one of the most significant things from the pilot's point of view is that once we get rid of the lead, we should be able over a fairly short period of time to transition to a synthetic motor oil. And when we transition to the synthetic motor oil, we should then be able without any serious issue to transition to 80, 100, 110 or 20 hour oil change intervals instead of 30 or 25 or 35 hour oil change intervals. That's a huge advantage with dispatchability for busy flight departments, uh, flight schools, uh, even owner operators, the, the hassle of doing that. 
Um, and the combustion chambers uh, are free of, of deposits and all that other gunk. Uh, there's every realistic, uh, the, you know, there's every real reason to believe that uh, the engine durability uh, question is going to improve uh, substantially. Okay. Uh, tell, ask me that question in five or 10 years. Okay. Yeah, well, we're going to be running it but between now and then, and uh, we'll probably have some pretty good answers. I just want to get a, a couple, two or three more questions out before you have to leave with us. Um, these sure. are coming in, coming in from viewers. Um, will the UL fuel change carb for carburetor performance? No. Uh, okay. we, we very carefully uh, instrumented up uh, the carburetor on a Cessna 172 uh, with uh, lots of thermocouples and measured all the temperatures and the heat of vaporization and carb heat and all that other stuff. And it was almost indistinguishable. Okay. How about uh, this one uh, come in from a viewer? Uh, will the unleaded fuel properly lubricate the uh, valve train? Uh, lead is not a lubricant. That is about as hoary an old wives tale as exists or has ever existed in aviation. There is published data from the FAA from the tech center that demonstrates that. Uh, that demonstration took place, very convincing demonstration in a published report uh, from flight testing that was done in 1989. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there's all kinds of old wives tales about valve seat recession being protected by lead and lead cushions of valve seats. It's all complete horse hockey and nonsense. And there's perfectly good engineering studies that demonstrate that. Okay, campfire folklore. We'll uh, we'll put that in that column around the uh, case of PBR. Um, how about uh, fuel delivery? This one's coming in from Hawaii. Um, a uh, tour pilot is asking us: Is the, is it potentially possible? I, I don't know how this could be. How it, how it could. Uh, have a connection, but is it potentially possible that um, that there are FBOs that are waiting for unleaded fuel to keep from stocking up on leaded fuel? Because there is apparently is a fuel slowdown or a something of that nature going on uh, at, at places in the country. Well, look, the rollout of G100UL is not going to happen in a month or even three months or six months. There's a huge infrastructure changeover. Right now, the supply chain's still in a chaotic mess. Uh, it's gonna take a while. Uh, there's a pretty good inventory of lead sitting in the refineries right now, uh, of tetraethyl lead sitting in ISO containers. And if they shut us off on lead from England tomorrow, there's still at least a year or two's worth of lead left in the refiners. So I don't really think there's a concern about you know 100 low lead going away tomorrow or next month. Okay, so that uh, there's no correlation there. Okay, two more questions. More than I got to run. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think you've covered this already. The fuel can be made by any refinery that meets the the published standard. Is that correct? The fuel can be made by any competent refinery, or it can be made even by somebody that has just got a, a series of tanks and can operate as a blender. Uh, and our commitment to, uh, to the industry and in particular to AvFuel that has been helping us with some of the logistics is that any qualified blender or refiner that meets the FAA approved quality assurance manual standards is gonna be allowed to produce the fuel. Okay. Well, thanks for your time, George. I really appreciate right. you coming on board with us and uh, talking about the SDC. We're excited to get the 100 uh, UL out there. I know I'm excited about it. Jim's excited about it. And a lot of our members are excited about it. I got to run, folks. Thanks for your time. With that, we'll um, bring on uh, Mike Mattern from Titan Aviation Fuels. And he's going to talk to us about all kinds of things from uh, how it's made, where it's made, and, and how it gets to your tank. Uh, Mike, the floor is yours. Good morning. All right, uh, first of all, it's an honor to be here and having the opportunity to speak to personnel. Um, Titan is committed to safety. We'll go ahead and bring up our first slide. 
Again, Titan Aviation definitely believes in quality control to ensure that what products that we're selling are distributing to different FBOs meets the current ASTM standards. With that being said, it's um, a never ending process. Uh, a lot of people, uh, our next slide, I'm sorry, I don't have control, which is good. All right, some people have questioned uh, how the fuel gets. The two fuels that we're specifically talking about are the two currently approved by ASTM standards, either 1655 for uh, Jet A or uh, D910 for Aviation 100 low leg. Uh, all fuel is manufactured at multiple refineries throughout the United States then it's basically delivered. In the case of jet fuel, it almost always starts off its delivery at a pipeline, and the pipeline goes out throughout the United States. Uh, one of the facts I normally bring up, let's say if we start somewhere in Texas or Louisiana, that fuel that's going through that pipeline, then in turn will get somewhere up on the um, East Coast, Northern uh, terminals, in somewhere between 12 and 14 days. In the case of um, 100 low lead, it is strictly distributed and none of it actually goes through the pipeline. It is always distributed by a third main, either rail cars, barges, or truck by transportation, 18 wheelers. Uh, some people say, hey, it's only jet fuel, it's, it's only uh, a let's say Titan's jet fuel, where we buy it from all the different vendors. Uh, I've got another little animated slide coming up to show basically, uh, you can go ahead and swap slides. Some people think that there's an area in there that stops it. If you'll notice the slide, the green is gasoline. It's going into a standard pipeline. Notice that it fills the pipeline, all the valves are shut to keep it from cross contamination until it gets to the wherever it's being distributed, one of those mini tanks that are located. Notice there is nothing that breaks in between there. Right after the gas, we had diesel. There is some cross contamination of the diesel into the jet fuel, or I'm sorry, into the gasoline. But you'll notice as it gets down, the valves on the gas truck close or the gas tank, and now the jet opens. Now, when the jet opens here, Notice that we shut it off going into gasoline. We do allow a small amount of cross contamination into the diesel, and then it goes into jet. There's no valves or anything that actually stops or in between the two products. There's always a cross contamination. So with that being said, if I bought fuel, i.e. we'll say Titan's fuel is being bought from a refinery, and it's in Louisiana, it's in the Titan, Somewhere along the time, we'll know that that fuel is coming, say, through Greensboro, North Carolina. So at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, when the fuel is going through there, is when the valve opens and that fuel magically goes in. With that being said, there is no difference from the fuel that goes into a commingle, commingle tank. So in other words, other distributors will have fuel in the same tank that we have our fuel in. And magically, when I uh, show up at the um, terminal, I just run around the terminals. And when we put our 8,000 gallons of fuel into a transport truck, bringing it to any FBO, at that time, I say I put my hand on it and it magically becomes Titan fuel. What it really means is all the fuel, whether it's jet, diesel, or gasoline, is commingled into one tank and it is guaranteed back to that ASTM standards when they put it on to a transport truck and then magically it becomes Titan's fuel or other distributors fuel. All right, next slide, sir. All right, two things that we're talking about are the fuels of Bailey in there would be um, 100 low lead for all piston pounders and then commercial jet A. Uh, there are a Jet A1, which is only made and manufactured outside the United States. Everywhere from Canada to Mexico and the rest of the world commercially uses Jet A1. In the United States, because of costs, we basically start all of our products of Jet A. The only difference in that is a freeze point. 
and well, that comes into play if you're going up to altitude and flying for a long period of time. One exception to that is if we're going to make Jet A1 in the United States, it's normally made for the uh, military use. And the Jet A1 freeze point is the base fuel that is used for JP8. And if you look at the JP8, there's some other chemicals and other degrees that are brought in there. But the only difference between Jet A and Jet A1, which is a base fuel for the military is it has a lower freeze point. All right, next slide, sir. All right, uh, these are just some of the examples. They ask how they're made. We're talking about blending. One of the most items that is in jet fuel that people are familiar with is called diagme or fizzy. Most people call it Pris. Pris is actually sort of like Kleenex. It becomes a brand name. Pris is just a additive that is made. Our dice is another brand name. That additive is then mixed into the fuel. And the ideal situation is somewhere between 8,000 gallons. When you have 8,000 gallons of fuel, you use a minimum of eight gallons or a maximum of 12 gallons for the blend ratio that you want to use to ensure the proper additives. If you look at some of the other ones there in the case of status 450, we're only using four milliliters into a thousand gallons and corrosion inhibitor and the uh, lubricity, they're actually at a, even a smaller rate of milliliters. So it's not an easy blending system when you're only putting, uh, you know, in the case of four milliliters of status 450 into a thousand jets. These are normally done only at the refineries and JP8, which is the standard military for, uh, fuel that's being blended for the military, is not really commercial available. There are a couple of refineries that will make it in small amounts that you can buy for say testing engines or something of that nature, but it's not ready available. All JP8 that is manufactured is normally disposed of strictly for the military. Next slide, sir. All right, here's some helpful tips that we just brought down on there. There are some different items that are brought in to uh, jet fuel. Biobore, there again, that is used to treat the micro growth that goes into the uh, fuel. Uh, one of the key elements I tell people, the fuel will only ever have a micro growth start if you have water. And if the ha proper housekeeping is done throughout the United States and at the FBOs and they remove water on a daily basis, you should never have to treat for buyer bore for a bug infestation. And there again, the shock treatment is just 270 parts per million. And that's one ounce of bio bore for every 37 gallons of jet fuel if in fact you actually have a infestation. I don't like to have people blend the biobore in because theoretically, once we blend the fuel with biobore, we have to tell every end user that we had biobore added into the fuel. But there are certain aircraft that do require it. Uh, parts per million, just something I want to bring up before we talk about uh, uh, filtration unit on there. And there again, what is a part per million? Well, you know, it's that $1 bill and a million dollars down in Vegas, or in this case, one inch and 16 miles, or one minute and two years. I mean, a parts per million is a really small amount. And jet fuel will always have some water measured in third parts per million. You're allowed to have up to 30 parts per million and the fuel is still on specification. Most filtrations will remove it somewhere down to three to five parts per million. All right, next slide, sir. All right, there's different additives that uh, on here. Uh, you must make sure the recommendation regarding the cap uh, compatibility of the products. There are a few common additives that we have, an anti-knock, an anti-oxygen, static displacer, a corrosion inhibitor, icing inhibitor, which is an anti-icing. We actually have a metal deactivator. They're a boicide or biobore. 
and thermal stability. Any of these additives can be placed in the fuel, which are normally done at the refinery to make sure it meets the specifications within the ASTM 1655 or the D910. All right, next slide. All right, the Energy Institute uh, basically comes up with the uh, icing inhibitor and the corrosion thing. I brought this up because this has been a major incident in our items that have transposed. There's been seven or eight cases where DEF, if anybody drives a diesel truck, the DEF is basically put in to clean the exhaust system on trucks. And we've had that DEF that's been pl in, placed into jet fuel in place of the fizzy, which is an anti-icing. In uh, more than one cases, it is caused complete engine failure in flight. And uh, luckily we have not had any incidents that have caused uh, death due to pilots knowing exactly, I guess, how to play the game when you have a dual engine failure and be able to glide into an airport uh, with an aircraft that has done and actually saved lives. Next slide. All right, the fizzy uh, looking at again, Fizzy is basically injected into the fuel as an anti-icing inhibitor on the jet fuel itself, where the DEF is actually put into the fuels or into the um, system on the truck of the cleaning of the exhaust system to for part of the Clean Air Act. Next, sir. So again, there is a procedure and the uh, FAA and has come out and we actually have a procedure at any airport or supposed to have a written procedure on, and personnel trained on who can do the servicing of the DEF that goes into the diesel trucks and into the anti-icing which goes into the jet fuel in particular. Those people are supposed to be trained and we try to actually separate them as far as humanly possible to ensure we don't have any cross-contamination. Next slide. All right, there again, the DEF is indicated in the blue. We have now tagged all of the tanks on the trucks, but the bad part is the tank on the truck for the DEF, and then on the opposite side of our trucks is there's a five gallon or a stainless steel tank is where you put the anti-icing. So as long as we have a human that's in charge of uh, doing the uh, proper servicing of those two, there's always that possibility of uh, having a cross-contamination. Next slide, sir. Uh, these are some uh, filters that were taken out of the aircraft of where the DEF, the DEF, was actually placed into the fizzy bottle and then injected into the fuel. And uh, in this case here, it completely housed uh, fuel starvation of the engines, which caused dual engine flame out. Next slide, sir. This is just portion of the process, uh, policy that we have where you must have a, uh, the FBO has a uh, indication to ensure that the, uh, Fizzy can only be placed into the fizzy bottle by a trained personnel. And then the DEF can only be placed into a, a tank that is made for the DEF for the engine. In every case though, there's been a line personnel at the FBO who has either selected the wrong container or uh, had the wrong container in the wrong spot and placed it into the wrong container on the air or on the fuel truck. And then once the truck was uh, servicing an aircraft, it was then injected into the fuel system, which caused the problem. Next slide, sir. All right, this is just a uh, common slide that we talked about filtration. And um, if everybody knows what a micron is, uh, a micron, and we'll say everybody has 20-20 vision, the human eye can see a 35 micron dot. 
most of our filters, or I should say all the filters that meet the current edition, which is six edition on the filters, actually will filter down to a half a micron. So every time there is a problem of on an aircraft where we find something in the aircraft fuel system, I always answer this question or get the question answer. You know, we had to get it from the fuel system. Well, we filter at the refinery level, then we do it at the terminal level, both in the filters and out of filtration. Then it's either distributed by rail, road, or a pipeline or a barge to an airport storage. There again, it is also then ran through another set of filters going into the airport storage. And then it's filtered out of the airport storage and goes into a delivery truck or into a um, pipeline underneath there for a um, system, a hydrant system where we fuel it. The final filtration is also right prior to within usually uh, the length of a 50 foot hose of the aircraft. So it's almost virtually impossible to get dirty fuel, you know, from a system that runs through all these filter checks into your aircraft. Now, there has been cases where filters have actually ruptured uh, or have failed into the maintenance procedure where they were improperly installed. But, you know, in good faith, 99.99 and of all cases, we do the checks and balances and the filters will ensure that no cross contamination as far as particulates or water gets into an aircraft. Next slide, sir. Well, this is just strictly a filter that's going into airport storage. We have a pre-filter, which that basically saves the other two filters, which costs more, by removing all particulates prior to that going into. A clay filter is actually to remove any surfactants. And a surfactant is anything sort of as a soap, if you want to call it, something that will break the bond between water and oil. So a clay uh, filters are normally at all terminals and some airport storages. Not all fuel will go through a clay treater. The last filtration that we have is known as a filter separator. That basically we have a coalescent filter which takes the suspended water. Again, we're talking parts per million and we coalesce that into larger droplets which in turn will fall out of the system. And the coalescer also stops all particulates. Uh, anything greater than one micron will not go through it. Then the second stage of that filter is a water separator. It ensures that any water that we separated does not go downstream. It basically traps it into the filter vessel. And that's the importance that we must do daily checks and sump that vessel daily to ensure that uh, no water. It also usually has a water defense system on it that if it happened to get a slug of water and we have a lot of water in the vessel, it will actually shut down the pumping system if more water is detected it could possibly be forced downstream into an aircraft. Next slide. Again, this is just a breakdown of the individual filter vessel that shows all the different mechanisms that are built into it. We have a coalescer, water separator, a water slug, a pressure relief and an air eliminator at the top. All of this is to ensure that clean, dry fuel will go downstream and be placed inside the aircraft. And we use this same filter vessel, or you can be used, on jet or avgas. Next slide. One of the other things that uh, just make everybody aware, there is a change in the filters that are going to change. We have what is known as a monitor. Uh, better known as a go-no-go -no -go filter, a water absorbing filter. In 2018, it was determined that these filters were failing in the industry. Uh, I will say a good thing, we did not have many failures at all within the United States where we actually take care of good housekeeping and the water and stuff is actually sumped. 
but in some places outside the United States, the super absorbent polymer, and you'll notice it almost looks like a honey. That is the absorbent polymer inside the filters that when not properly housekeeping, you put water into it at a low slow rate, it had the polymer turning into the gooey stuff, which in turn dries to a hard, um, almost an enamel type thing once the air gets to it. These filters are being uh, replaced. Um, we actually have the filters, or I should say one of the manufacturer has a filter that replaces it and we have started installing them. One of the things that brings it up, if you're a partner into an FBO or have an ownership in one, your filters where a normal CDF 230 filter currently costs about $35, it will uh, be about $190 per filter. When you have 10 of those filters in your vessel, the price goes from about 350 to close to $2,000. This is going to be one of the other ones. They haven't completely outlawed the monitor filters yet, but uh, it's just a matter of time before they're actually replaced. Next slide. Uh, I believe that is your last slide, Mike. All right. Questions, I'm sure, are. Get myself off mute. Hey, Mike. Wow, there's there, there's a tremendous amount of information that you just you just shared with us. Um, so many questions. Uh, I'll go to our audience here, but but in the meantime, let me ask you a couple of short questions. I think does Jet A and or Avgas, I guess at this point, what's the shelf life or tank life? How long is the fuel good for? All right, the fuel is certified by the manufacturers for a shelf life into the Energy Institute for six months and without replenishment. Now, when I say without replenishment, let's say uh, you buy the 8,000 gallons, you have a you know 10,000 gallon tank, so you put 8,000 in it. At the 179th day, if you replenish 50% of what you have left. So let's say that we sold 50% of that, we have 4,000 gallons left in the tank. If you add 2,000 gallons plus one, in other words, take 2,001 gallon and add it to that uh, 4,000 you have left, your clock begins uh, another six month certification. If you go to the 180th day, then the fuel must be tested back to the complete ASTM standards prior to selling that fuel. And that's the shelf life for both jet and avgas. Now you mentioned, uh, and you and I were talking earlier about some people that uh, like to carry their fuel with it. If you put it in a certified drum where there's no air breathing at all, the shelf life doubles. So you could uh, take it we do it a lot down in Australia or something. They'll buy it in drums and uh, then they get a year's worth of shelf life from the data manufacturer. Okay, so that leads me to a question that one of our viewers asked earlier. Uh, say you put it in a 55 gallon drum and you, you, you open it, you take some fuel out of it and then you, you know, recap it. You've opened up the fuel a time or two or more. Um, what's the... What's the shelf life on it at that point? Is it back once to the 180? Once you start using it, your six months starts. So once you okay. break the seal. So if you got the drum, took it to a remote location and it's set there for six months, it's still got six months left on that shelf life for you okay. to actually use and it. If you started it at 90 days, then your shelf life starts at that day. Okay, and I presume that would be the same for whether it's a, a rubber blivet or, or any, any container. Actually, the uh, it's a, in the drum itself. So uh, uh, we use a what is known as an epoxy line drum, and that's the only one that the shelf life in the EI designates in that. So okay. If you're using a bladder type tank or something. If um, this is a personal experience, um, does does Jet A when it goes bad, does it discolor? Does it change colors? 
theoretically, it will not change colors unless it's acted upon by an outside source, i.e. So I'm sure some people have seen it where somebody has a pump fuel out of their storage hoses or something for a period of time. There's actually a, an industry standards where we try to replace the fuel for overwing nozzles or re, I hate to say the word recirculation because we don't like to recirculate, but uh, have movement of that hose, uh, overwing hose every seven days. And then if you have a single point hose, replace the quantity of that hose every 14 days. Because if not, they will actually start to discolor because they react in the hose. But I have actually opened a tank. Um, I shouldn't say opened a tank. We had a customer that uh, bought a location that had three 20K tanks and that fuel was underground down in Mississippi, 60,000 gallons of fuel that the tanks were supposed to be empty and we tested all three of those tanks and he inherited 60,000 gallons of good fuel. And it'd been underground for five months or five years. Let me ask you a question. I, again, personal experience. I recently sumped a, a helicopter that had Jet A in it. The helicopter had been sitting for about 10 years. It had fuel in the tanks. The fuel that I drew out was as brown as the background behind me. And I know that Jet A went into it, which means it was clear when it went in. It was brown when it came out. What are your What are your thoughts on that? I would say it was probably a leaching of the bladder itself uh, in the fuel system. Uh, believe it or not, as much as I and I should have put that slide in, I didn't. Uh, I have a slide that has red, blue green, yellow, and clear. And they're as yellow and as green as can be. And I asked which one are jet fuel. And believe it or not, every one of them are jet fuel. The ATA 103 specifically states that you can have jet fuel of any of those colors. And that is not grounds for cross or for disqualification of the fuel. And it just depends on the crude and the, uh, where it's being manufactured. Okay. Um, how, how often, so if I go to my local airport, how, how often should the fuel tanks at the airport be checked, be tested? You know, there are, you outlined a, a whole host of testing and, and filtering systems in the supply chain. It sounds to me like it's virtually impossible to get bad fuel out of a out of an FBO uh, fuel tank, but you know I'm still a little bit distrustful. So if if the FBO is doing their part, how often should they test their fuel? We as Titan and I preach and teach. We use the uh, um, ATA 103 as basically the Bible is our standard. And it states that daily checks, and in our case, there's 13 daily checks you should be performed on every dispensing unit prior to the first fueling of the day. And that goes down to 10 in the case of um, Avgas. There's 10 checks that we recommend that all of our FBOs do on a daily basis prior to the first sell of the day. Okay. So you alluded to it before, we were talking before the show and, and uh, you know, when I do, when I'm out doing flight reviews or uh, training with folks, sometimes they'll draw a sample and, and it's, you know, you couldn't fill a thimble with, with how much fuel that they drew out of, the, out of the tank. Is there a recommendation on how much fuel should be drawn to do a, an, an accurate sample? All right, in the case of uh, different samples, the case of the filter vessel, we recommend uh, the ATA says one gallon. We state that you must draw a sample to ensure that you've cleared all lines prior to taking your actual sample. An example would be on the tank of a uh, of 12K tank, you go up 10 feet, you come over four feet and down 10 feet to get it back to the ground. That's 24 feet, that's a little over one gallon. So in that case, we actually have a decal by every supping point 
that we provide that says, and we're the 10 feet up, uh, four across and 10 down, a minimum of two gallons would have to be trump, uh, sumped to ensure that you got a true bottom sample or a true sample from the bottom. If not, you're just clearing the lines. So one gallon minimum or whatever is required to draw uh, a, to ensure a true bottom sample is achieved. Okay, it's uh, we're up on the hour, but I want to ask one more question because in the helicopter community, our members are out doing the things that it takes to keep our our society vibrant and safe. Um, you know, they're doing helicopter work, which is uh, aerial firefighting, erecting and, and repairing power grids, and lifting air conditioners on top of uh, skyscrapers, uh, doing aerial tours and rescuing people, doing all the things that that you know aviation will allow us to do to keep our society safe and functioning. When we do that, when our members do that, they often have to take fuel with them out to the field. They take it with them to the field site. Helicopters don't have the range that airplanes do, and it's not efficient to um, you know, work right alongside of an airport and FBO. What can our operators do to ensure when they take their fuel to the field with them that they're actually dispensing safe quality fuel you know, for a, a period of days or weeks? All right, one of the key elements I'd say any time that fuel is going into the wing is to ensure it's going through an approved, um, in this case, fifth or sixth edition filter. You know, and you can buy the small portable pumps that are certified for your uh, jet fuel, and you can buy a filter vessel, uh, a small one that pumps, you know, 30 to 40 gallons a minute. And you can buy a filter housing that clips right onto the motor or thing, or you can actually clip it into the line. And the filtration, like I said, it will remove down to one micron. So if you had, in the case of the water resorbent, let's say you had a pint of water in the bottom of a 55 gallon drum, this filter will actually stop that. It will shut down flow uh, of your fuel and quit pumping. So we built that into the safety aspect that if in fact, you know, you take in, I won't say a shortcut, but somehow you didn't know the water was in there. We've got a mechanical means to overcome not being able to sump that 55 gallon drum. Okay. Um, we'll leave the questions at that. Um, if any of our viewers have more questions that they would like to ask and uh, send them to, uh, to us at HAI and uh, we will get them out to Mike or uh, to George. Um, Mike, really appreciate the presentation. There, you know, your presentation was short. I know you give seminars that last, you know, two or three days in length, and uh, so there was no way to to absorb all of the information that you have about how to how to manage the fuel systems. Um, but really appreciate your time. And uh, if you want to leave us with any closing thoughts, it's, it's well. It's great. Uh, feel free to provide my phone number. I uh, I spend ninety percent of my days answering questions one way or the other. And as far as our seminars, um, anybody that would want to come and get another knowledge, like I said, it's three and a half days and we start with taking a sample and we change with changing out filters. And as long as you're not a competitor of uh, an FBO pumping the other fuel from another counselor, there's usually no charge for the seminar, uh, for the thing for an individual that just wants to, you know, increase his knowledge and, uh, you know, I uh, enjoy having them on there. Again, it was my pleasure and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak, sir. Well, let me expand on that just a little bit uh, for our viewers. If um, if operators, helicopter operators or HAI members out there want to send someone from their safety community or, or uh, operations community uh, to one of your seminars, then they're authorized to do that. Is that, is that what I just heard? Yeah, as long as, like I said, my boss doesn't... Uh, you know, honestly, uh, I have uh, Southwest Airlines personnel. I have I just talked to people from Hawaiian Airlines. I don't know why anybody would want to come from Hawaii to come to my next seminar, but they are. Uh, you know, we provide it free of charge to any Titan customers that buy fuel, you know, at your location or something of that nature. So as long as you're not a FBO of one of our competitors one way or that nature, but if you're just an individual company and have it, you know, um, basically send myself an email or go to our website and you can sign up onto the, uh, 
web things. Uh, we have two more going this year. I actually short notice one next, or actually this month, and then one in the month of October, and they're both posted on our website. Uh, I don't know how many okay. people we had at this one, but I'll. Uh, it would not surprise me to have 150 plus personnel in Atlanta. Uh, so it's a real interesting three days. Right. Well, we, we'd be happy to have you come down to Atlanta in March for our, our annual Heli Expo. And uh, sounds like a great opportunity for the HAI members to, to jump on board with you and, and learn a lot more about fuel, especially if they're in the safety arena or ops arena. So thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Dan, back to you, bud. Okay, Mike, hey, thanks so much for taking your time, uh, sharing your time with us today. Um, you offered to provide your phone number and address. What we'll do is um, I will, uh, as we complete the recording, I will make sure that we have a slide with your address and phone number in it. Uh, we will also try to put it in the text on our YouTube page and on our website uh, when we get the uh, information posted. So if uh, any of the participants do want to reach out, we'll make sure that they have an avenue to do that. But again, thank you so much uh, for sharing your time today. Uh, as Zach said, this one was fascinating, just tons and tons of information. So um, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. And um, have, everybody have a safe day. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your uh, day as well. All right. Yeah, just a few things to uh, wrap up here. Uh, first of all, uh, our upcoming webinars. Uh, September 22nd. Uh, we are now doing them the second and fourth Fridays of every month. Uh, Pre-flight, right and wrong. Uh, at least that's what, uh, what we have scheduled. I understand that there could be a little bit of a conflict there, so we're going to be looking to see what we can uh, put in place if necessary. On October 13th, please uh, let your uh, family, friends, anybody that's in the military that's thinking about transitioning out in the next year or so. This is not something that if they're leaving next month, you know, they should have already got to, you know, been planning. We want to help uh, that transition, smooth it out, make uh, sure that they have exactly what they need to succeed in the rotorcraft industry. And so we'll have a bunch of uh, former military personnel ready, in transition, and they will be uh, trying to help out right. as best they can. On October 27th, we have a one-on-one -on -one with Clyde Waltman of Leonardo. Jim Viola, our president and CEO, will sit down and have kind of a fireside chat with him and go through uh, uh, topics of the day, things that are going on with Leonardo and uh, how Mr. Waltman is uh, adjusting to his new role in, uh, uh, at Leonardo. We do have a questionnaire that we'll be sending out very shortly. We uh, do appreciate uh, your taking the time to uh, take a look at it, fill it out. A uh, question of particular interest to me is if you have any suggestions for upcoming webinars, we do appreciate it. If you have an idea for HAI in general, if you have a suggestion what we could do better, uh, maybe some change something we're already doing, we're always looking for new information. So the best way to do that is to send uh, Jim Viola an email uh, at president at rotor.org. He does see all the emails and he does uh, act on those and uh, assign them to staff. If you want more information about the rotorcraft industry, if you're not getting enough, a great way to do that is uh, through HAI. Free publications that are not required. You do not have to be a member uh, to join. Uh, we have Rotor Magazine. It's published once a quarter. It's an award-winning publication that really gets into more depth on issues. We have some fascinating newsmakers that are uh, usually covered, uh, some really interesting stories. And so uh, welcome you to subscribe to that. It's free for anybody in the United States. It's printed or digital. Uh, if you do want the print version and you live outside the United States, there is a small fee charged for mailing only. We're not here to try to make a profit on the magazine. Rotor Daily is our daily news aggregator. We uh, go through all the day's news that we can find so that you don't have to we put it in one place. There's usually somewhere between uh, 10 and 20 stories that we get posted every business day here in the US. And to subscribe for that is free as well. It comes to your email. I used to uh, receive it, uh, sit in the morning and uh, have my morning coffee. Uh, take a look uh, through it and see what was going on. Easiest way to subscribe to both is go to rotor.org slash subscribe. The big red letters there on the screen. I'll invite you to do it. 
That does wrap, wrap up our webinar for this week. We are grateful to George, to Mike, to Zach, and to Jim for joining us today, for sharing their time. Until next time, we ask that you fly safe and that you be safe, and we'll see you again very soon.